I'm Ruth Johnson. I work for Football Unites Races and Divides. My role is basically to try and help women and girls to get involved in football uh, and remove as many barriers to participation as possible. Uh, every Tuesday we, we run a free open women and girls football session here at the UMIC Centre. I've been interested in playing football for most of my life and when I was a, a child it was really difficult to get involved. There were very few opportunities. And we've, we found out that there was quite a bit of women's football, particularly around the First World War, when lots of women were working in factories, particularly munitions factories. And the FA passed a resolution in December 1921 requesting their member clubs to not allow any women's teams to play football on their grounds because they thought it was unsuitable for women and should not be encouraged. And that that ban remained in place for 50 years. So there's a group of us uh, come together to form a stoppage time sort of project group. And some of us from the team, we decided to go exploring some of the places where women's football matches have been played in, in the past. So we set out from here at the UMIC Centre around the corner to the Sheaf House pub on Bramwell Lane. Um, it used to be a big sports ground just behind the pub and we believe one of the first women's matches in Sheffield took place there in 1895. The football match might have taken place here, there was certainly a ground situated here at the next to Bram Lane football ground in Sheffield, so we believe this is the site of one of the first women's matches in Sheffield. So we think the people that played here, the British Ladies Football Club, they included such luminaries as uh, Florence Dixie and Nettie Honeyball. Here we have a report from the Sheffield Independent from the 7th of May 1895 of a match that took place here at the Chief, Chief House ground, the Lady Footballers in Sheffield. Curious to see what football played like, like, like ladies is like, some 3,000 people assembled at Chief House ground last evening to witness the members of the British Ladies Football Club. They saw two teams of comely damsels clad in appropriate costumes, distinguished as the Reds and the Blues play the game in a gentle, amusing, occasionally earnest, but mainly lackadaisical style, which prohibits all ideas of football being dangerous for ladies to play. Julia and I went to Sheffield Hallam University Sports Park on Bawtry Road, which was a bit of a nostalgia trip for me because I used to play there when I was playing for Sheffield Hall United and that really was the first time in my life that I'd had the opportunity to play 11 side competitive football. But there's another reason we went there uh, and that is we think it's the site of uh, a women's match that took place on Boxing Day 1916. During the First World War uh, thousands of women started working in munitions factories and a lot of them also formed football teams but we think this is the site of uh, the old Vickers works ground uh, where some of those matches were played and uh, there was one in particular that took place on Boxing Day 1916 which was attended by about 10,000 people at a, at a ground that was really only built to accommodate about 2,000 but they, they raised about £100 for the Wounded Colliers Fund. Uh, it was a newspaper report that said the, the winning goal was scored by somebody known affectionately as Little Fatty who went on an amazing run which involved doing a wall pass with a spectator. One of the defenders in coming out to try and stop her collided with the referee and fell over in the slosh. <laughs> Julia and I went to the Tinsley and Templeborough area of Sheffield in search of the site of the National Projectile Factory. So we're here at Templeborough. This Templeborough was, was a massive site during World War I. Uh, the National Projectile Factory, which was uh, at first factory, basically it doubled in size during World War I in order to make ammunition you know, to fire in the battlefields. And uh, that's when women came into the workforce. So there would have been women who hadn't worked before who were attracted to come and work at these big, horrible, hot, dirty steelworks doing very, very tough jobs. And as part of their recreation, they played various sports, including football, which is where the women's teams come from. And I just want to read some stuff from the Bombshell, which was the factory magazine, basically, talking about what it was like. 
it is the opinion of some people that playing football destroys a woman's chief charm. That elusive and indefinable quality, which for want of a better word, we feel femininity. Associating the football ground to that of the shop floor, he stated, if we can learn to apply the rules of football and cricket outside the playing fields to the game of life, then it will be well worth and more than worth any real or imaginary sacrifice of early in Victorian ideals. So for the war, you can forget your femininity, femininity lasses, go and do the horrible work, but have a bit of football as well. As we know, it didn't last that long. Our explorations also took us to Sheffield United's training ground on Furs Hill Crescent. The Academy's been here about 20 years, I think. Before that, the Forge Masters had their sports ground here. Uh, before that, we think it was the location of the Norfolk and Atlas Works ground. During the First World War, the ground, which also known as the Pittsmore Sports Ground, uh, was used for women's football matches, amongst other sporting events. In April 1917, uh, a match took place here between teams from the Camel Laird, Norfolk and Atlas Works and uh, it attracted a big crowd of about 5,000 people. The newspaper report at the time describes, it says, uh, for nearly an hour before the match, a stream of spectators along Row Lane gave promise of a big gate and latecomers, finding themselves unable to see anything of the match, sought points of vantage on walls, railings and other buildings near the clubhouse with the result that the roof of one of these old buildings fell in with a crash just after the match had commenced, carrying with it about 30 men and boys. Several people were severely shaken, but it was found that only one was seriously hurt. Kim and I also had the opportunity to visit Hillsborough where the famous Dick Kerr ladies team from Preston played Atlanta ladies from Huddersfield. We're really excited to be here at Hillsborough today because uh, almost 100 years ago, on May the 4th, 1921, one of the most famous women's football teams of the early 20th century, Dick Kerr ladies FC, they played a team from Huddersfield called Huddersfield Atalanta. In front, of a, in front of a crowd of what we think was probably 25,000 people. So it was uh, obviously women's football was a huge thing at the time. I think partly because of the novelty of women playing football. Uh, you know, the idea that we, weren't, we were too feminine to play football, but we did. And uh, they played it very well. And the Dick Kerr ladies team sort of were, were, became a bit of a world phenomenon at the time. A few months later after that uh, match in December 1921, there was a huge body blow to women's football and it all came to a halt. On 5th of December, the FA unanimously passed this resolution. I'm just going to read it because I haven't put my glasses on. So, complaints having been made as to football being played by women, the council feel impelled to express their strong opinion that the game of football is quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. Complaints have also been made as to the conditions under which some of these matches have been arranged and played, the appropriation of receipts to other than charitable objects. So for these reasons, the council requests clubs and obviously the association to cease and desist with women's football. I thought they just didn't like women playing football. End of. It wasn't seen as feminine, it wasn't seen as an appropriate thing for women to do. The board finished, women were going back into the home. I think it's part of that whole that whole idea about what women were for. You know, it was okay for them to be in the munitions uh, factories during the war, do the, do, the, do the patriotic job, but after that, go back and go back to your, uh, go back to your kids in the kitchen. Thank you very much. And that's part of it. Don't play football, don't think about the outside world. So it was 50 years. Uh, in 1971, the ban was finally lifted. So women weren't able to play football in the FA clubs for 50 years, quite shocking. I think the stoppage time project is important because um, a lot of people think that women only started playing football in the last few years um, and this goes to show that that wasn't the case. I think when, when the ban came in, um, women lost uh, loads of opportunities to get a bit of independence, um, to I suppose bond with other women, to do something for themselves outside the home. Yeah. I think football is a feminist issue and uh, denying women and girls the access to football I think has, has been a way of, of keeping women and, and girls down. 
and the fact that women, women and girls can play football today um, has just made a huge difference to countless people's lives.